The Garden of Paradise by Hans Christian Andersen There once was a king's son who had a larger and more beautiful collection of books than anyone else in the world, and full of splendid copper plate engravings. He could read and obtain information respecting every people of every land, but not a word could he find to explain the situation of the Garden of Paradise, and this was just what he most wished to know. His grandmother had told him, when he was quite a little boy, just old enough to go to school, that each flower in the Garden of Paradise was a sweet cake, that the pistols were full of rich wine, that on one flower history was written, on another geography or tables. So those who wished to learn their lessons had only to eat some of the cakes, and the more they ate, the more history, geography, or tables they knew. He believed it all then. But as he grew older, and learnt more and more, he became wise enough to understand that the splendor of the Garden of Paradise must be very different to all this. Oh, why did Eve pluck the fruit from the Tree of Knowledge? Why did Adam eat the forbidden fruit? thought the king's son. If I had been there, it would never have happened, and there would have been no sin in the world. The Garden of Paradise occupied all his thoughts till he reached his seventeenth year. One day he was walking alone in the wood, which was his greatest pleasure, when evening came on. The clouds gathered, and the rain poured down as if the sky had been a water spout, and it was as dark as the bottom of a well at midnight. Sometimes he slipped over the smooth grass, or fell over stones that projected out of the rocky ground. Everything was dripping with moisture, and the poor prince had not a dry thread about him. He was obliged at last to climb over great blocks of stone, with water spurting from the thick moss. He began to feel quite faint, when he heard a most singular rushing noise, and saw before him a large cave, from which came a blaze of light. In the middle of the cave an immense fire was burning, and a noble stag, with its branching horns, was placed on a spit between the trunks of two pine trees. It was turning slowly before the fire and an elderly woman, as large and strong as if she had been a man in disguise, sat by, throwing one piece of wood after another into the flames. Come in, she said to the prince. Sit down by the fire and dry yourself. There is a great draught here, said the prince, as he seated himself on the ground. It will be worse when my sons come home, replied the woman. You are now in the cavern of the winds, and my sons are the four winds of heaven. Can you understand that? "'Where are your sons?' asked the prince. "'It is difficult to answer stupid questions,' said the woman. "'My sons have plenty of business on hand. "'They are playing at shuttlecock with the clouds up yonder in the king's hall.' "'And she pointed upwards. "'Oh, indeed,' said the prince. "'But you speak more roughly and harshly, "'and are not so gentle as the women I am used to. "'Yes, that is because they have nothing else to do. "'But I am obliged to be harsh, to keep my boys in order, "'and I can do it, although they are so headstrong. "'Do you see those four sacks hanging on the wall? "'Well, they are just as much afraid of those sacks "'as you used to be of the rat behind the looking-glass. "'I can bend the boys together and put them in the sacks "'without any resistance on their parts, I can tell you.' There they stay, and dare not attempt to come out until I allow them to do so. And here comes one of them. It was the north wind who came in, bringing with him a cold, piercing blast. Large hailstones rattled on the floor, and snowflakes were scattered around in all directions. He wore a bearskin dress and cloak. His seal-skin cap was drawn over his ears, long icicles hung from his beard, and one hailstone after another rolled from the collar of his jacket. Don't go too near the fire, said the prince, or your hands and face will be frostbitten. Frostbitten, said the north wind with a loud laugh. Why, frost is my greatest delight. What sort of a little snip are you? And how did you find your way to the cavern of the winds? He is my guest, said the old woman. And if you are not satisfied with that explanation, you can go into the sack. Do you understand me? That settled the matter. So the north wind began to relate his adventures, whence he came, and where he had been for a whole month. I come from the polar seas, he said. I have been on Bear's Island with the Russian walrus hunters. I sat and slept at the helm of their ship as they sailed away from North Cape. Sometimes when I woke, the storm birds would fly about my legs. They are curious birds. They give one flap with their wings, and then on their outstretched pinions soar far away. 
don't make such a long story of it said the mother of the winds what sort of a place is bear's island a very beautiful place where the floor of her dancing is smooth and flat as a plate half melted snow partly covered with moss sharp stones and skeletons of walruses and polar bears lie all about their gigantic limbs in a state of green decay it would seem as if the sun never shone there i blew gently to clear away the mist and then i saw a little hut which had been built from the wood of a wreck and was covered with the skins of the walrus the fleshy side outwards it looked green and red and on the roof sat a growling bear then I went to the seashore to look after birds' nests, and I saw the unfledged nestlings opening their mouths and screaming for food. I blew into the thousand little throats and quickly stopped their screaming. Farther on were walruses with pigs' heads and teeth a yard long, rolling about like great worms. You relate your adventures very well, my son, said the mother. It makes my mouth water to hear you. After that, continued the north wind the hunting commenced the harpoon was flung into the breast of the walrus so that a smoking stream of blood spurted forth like a fountain and besprinkled the ice then i thought of my own game i began to blow and set my own ships the great icebergs sailing so that they might crush the boats oh how the sailors howled and cried out but i howled louder than they they were obliged to unload their cargo and throw their chests and the dead walruses on the ice. Then I sprinkled snow over them and left them in their crushed boats to drift southward and to taste salt water. They will never return to Bear's Island. So you have done mischief, said the mother of the winds. I shall leave others to tell the good I have done, he replied. But here comes my brother from the west. I like him best of all, for he has the smell of the sea about him and brings in a cold, fresh air as he enters is that the little zephyr asked the prince yes it is the little zephyr said the old woman but he is not little now in years gone by he was a beautiful boy now that is all past he came in looking like a wild man and he wore a slouched hat to protect his head from injury in his hand he carried a club cut from a mahogany tree in the american forests not a trifle to carry whence do you come asked the mother I come from the wilds of the forests, where the thorny brambles form thick hedges between the trees, where the water snake lies in the wet grass, and mankind seems to be unknown. What were you doing there? I looked into the deep river and saw it rushing down from the rocks. The water drops mounted to the clouds and glittered in the rainbow. I saw the wild buffalo swimming in the river, but the strong tide carried him away amidst a flock of wild ducks, which flew into the air as the waters dashed onwards, leaving the buffalo to be hurled over the waterfall. This pleased me, so I raised a storm, which rooted up old trees and sent them floating down the river. And what else have you done? asked the old woman. I have rushed wildly across the savannas. I have stroked the wild horses and shaken the coconuts from the trees. Yes, I have many stories to relate, but I need not tell everything I know. You know it all very well, don't you, old lady? And he kissed his mother so roughly that she nearly fell backwards. Oh, he was indeed a wild fellow. Now in came the south wind, with a turban and a flowing Bedouin cloak. How cold it is here, said he, throwing more wood on the fire. It's easy to feel that the north wind has arrived here before me. Why, it is hot enough here to roast a bear, said the north wind. You are a bear yourself, said the other. Do you want to be put in the sack, both of you, said the old woman. Sit down now on that stone yonder and tell me where you have been. In Africa, mother, I went out with the Hottentots, who were lion hunting in the Kafir land, where the plains are covered with grass the color of a green olive, and here I ran races with the ostrich, but I soon outstripped him in swiftness. At last I came to the desert, in which lie the golden sands, looking like the bottom of the sea. Here I met a caravan, and the travelers had just killed their last camel to obtain water. There was very little for them, and they continued their painful journey beneath the burning sun and over the hot sands, which stretched before them a vast, boundless desert. Then I rolled myself in the loose sand and whirled it in burning columns over their heads. The dromedaries stood still in terror while the merchants drew their caftans over their heads and threw themselves on the ground before me, as they do before Allah, their God. Then I buried them beneath a pyramid of sand, which covers them all. 
when i blow that away on my next visit the sun will bleach their bones and travellers will see that others have been there before them otherwise in such a wild desert they might not believe it possible so you have done nothing but evil said the mother into the sack with you and before he was aware she had seized the south wind round the body and popped him into the bag he rolled about on the floor till she set herself upon him to keep him still these boys of yours are very lively said the prince yes she replied but i know how to correct them when necessary and here comes the fourth in came the east wind dressed like a chinese oh you come from that quarter do you said she i thought you had been in the garden of paradise i am going there to-morrow he replied i have not been there for a hundred years i have just come from china where i danced round the porcelain tower till all the bells jingled again in the streets an official flogging was taking place and bamboo canes were being broken on the shoulders of men of every high position from the first to the ninth grade they cried many thanks my fatherly benefactor but i am sure the words did not come from their hearts so i rang the bells till they sounded ding ding dong you are a wild boy said the old woman it is well for you that you are going to-morrow to the garden of paradise you always get improved in your education there drink deeply from the fountain of wisdom while you are there and bring home a bottle full for me that i will said the east wind but why have you put my brother south in a bag let him out for i want him to tell me about the phoenix bird the princess always wants to hear of this bird when i pay her my visit every hundred years if you will open the sack sweetest mother i will give you two pocketfuls of tea green and fresh as when i gathered it from the spot where it grew well for the sake of the tea and because you are my own boy i will open the bag she did so and the south wind crept out looking quite cast down because the prince had seen his disgrace there is a palm leaf for the princess he said the old phoenix the only one in the world gave it to me himself he has scratched on it with his beak the whole of his history during the hundred years he has lived she can there read how old phoenix set fire to his own nest and set upon it while it was burning like a hindu widow the dry twigs around the nest crackled and smoked till the flames burst forth and consumed the phoenix to ashes amidst the fire lay an egg red hot which presently burst with a loud report and out flew a young bird he is the only phoenix in the world and the king over all the other birds he has bitten a hole in the leaf which i give you and that is his greeting to the princess now let us have something to eat said the mother of the winds so they all sat down to feast on the roasted stag and as the prince sat by the side of the east wind they soon became good friends pray tell me said the prince who is that princess of whom you have been talking and where lies the garden of paradise ho ho said the east wind would you like to go there well you can fly off with me to-morrow but i must tell you one thing no human being has been there since the time of adam and eve i suppose you have read of them in your bible of course i have said the prince well continued the east wind when they were driven out of the garden of paradise it sunk into the earth but it retained its warm sunshine its balmy air and all its splendor the fairy queen lives there in the island of happiness where death never comes and all is beautiful i can manage to take you there to-morrow if you will sit on my back but now don't talk any more for i want to go to sleep and then they all slept when the prince awoke in the early morning he was not a little surprised at finding himself high up above the clouds he was seated on the back of the east wind who held him faithfully and they were so high in the air that woods and fields rivers and lakes as they lay beneath them looked like a painted map good morning said the east wind you might have slept on a while for there is very little to see in that flat country over which we are passing unless you like to count the churches they looked like spots of chalk on a green board the green board was the name he gave to the green fields and meadows it was very rude of me not to say good-bye to your mother and your brothers said the prince they will excuse you as you were asleep said the east wind and then they flew on faster than ever the leaves and branches of the trees rustled as they passed when they flew over seas and lakes the waves rose higher and the large ships dipped into the water like diving swans as darkness came on towards evening the great towns looked charming lights were sparkling now seen now hidden just as the sparks go out one after another on a piece of burnt paper 
The prince clapped his hands with pleasure, but the east wind advised him not to express his admiration in that manner, or he might fall down and find himself hanging on a church steeple. The eagle in the dark forests flies swiftly, but faster than he flew the east wind. The Cossack on a small horse rides lightly o'er the plains, but lighter still, past the prince on the wings of the wind. There are the Himalayas, the highest mountains in Asia, said the east wind. We shall soon reach the Garden of Paradise now. Then they turned southward, and the air became fragrant with the perfume of spices and flowers. Here figs and pomegranates grew wild, and the vines were covered with clusters of blue and purple grapes. Here they both descended to the earth, and stretched themselves on the soft grass, while the flowers bowed to the breath of the wind as if to welcome it. Are we now in the garden of paradise? asked the prince. No, indeed, replied the east wind, but we shall be there very soon. Do you see that wall of rocks, and the cavern beneath it, over which the grapevines hang like a green curtain? Through that cavern we must pass. Wrap your cloak round you, for while the sun scorches you here, a few steps farther, it will be icy cold. The bird flying past the entrance to the cavern feels as if one wing were in the region of summer, and the other in the depths of winter. So this, then, is the way to the Garden of Paradise, asked the prince as they entered the cavern. It was indeed cold, but the cold soon passed, for the east wind spread his wings, and they gleamed like the brightest fire. As they passed on through this wonderful cave, the prince could see great blocks of stone from which water trickled, hanging over their heads in fantastic shapes. Sometimes it was so narrow that they had to creep on their hands and knees, while at other times it was lofty and wide like the free air. It had the appearance of a chapel for the dead, with petrified organs and silent pipes. We seem to be passing through the valley of death to the garden of paradise, said the prince. But the east wind answered not a word, only pointed forwards to a lovely blue light which gleamed in the distance. The blocks of stone assumed a misty appearance, till at last they looked like white clouds in moonlight. The air was fresh and balmy, like a breeze from the mountains perfumed with flowers from a valley of roses. A river, clear as the air itself, sparkled at their feet, while in its clear depths could be seen gold and silver fish sporting in the bright water, and purple eels emitting sparks of fire at every moment, while the broad leaves of the water lilies that floated on its surface flickered with all the colors of the rainbow. The flower, in its color of flame, seemed to receive its nourishment from the water, as a lamp is sustained by oil. A marble bridge of such exquisite workmanship that it appeared as if formed of lace and pearls led to the island of happiness, in which blossomed the garden of paradise. The east wind took the prince in his arms, and carried him over, while the flowers and the leaves sang the sweet songs of his childhood in tones so full and soft that no human voice could venture to imitate. Within the garden grew large trees, full of sap, but whether they were palm trees or gigantic water plants, the prince knew not. The climbing plants hung in garlands of green and gold, like the illuminations on the margins of old missiles, or twined among the initial letters. Birds, flowers, and festoons appeared intermingled in seeming confusion. Close by, on the grass, stood a group of peacocks, with radiant tails outspread to the sun. The prince touched them, and found to his surprise that they were not really birds, but the leaves of the burdock tree, which shone with the colors of a peacock's tail. The lion and the tiger, gentle and tame, were springing about like playful cats among the green bushes, whose perfume was like the fragrant blossom of the olive. The plumage of the wood pigeon glistened like pearls as it struck the lion's mane with its wings, while the antelope, usually so shy, stood near, nodding its head as if it wished to join in the frolic. The fairy of paradise next made her appearance. Her raiment shone like the sun, and her serene countenance beamed with happiness like that of a mother rejoicing over her child. She was young and beautiful, and a train of lovely maidens followed her, each wearing a bright star in her hair. The east wind gave her the palm leaf, on which was written the history of the phoenix, and her eyes sparkled with joy. She then took the prince by the hand and led him into her palace, the walls of which were richly colored, like a tulip leaf when it is turned to the sun. The roof had the appearance of an inverted flower, and the colors grew deeper and brighter to the gazer. The prince walked to a window, and saw what appeared to be the tree of knowledge of good and evil, 
with Adam and Eve standing by, and the serpent near them. I thought they were banished from paradise, he said. The princess smiled, and told him that time had engraved each event on a window pane in the form of a picture, but, unlike other pictures, all that it represented lived and moved. The leaves rustled, and the persons went and came, as in a looking-glass. He looked through another pane, and saw the ladder in Jacob's dream, on which the angels were ascending and descending with outspread wings. All that had ever happened in the world here lived and moved on the panes of glass, in pictures such as time alone could produce. The fairy now led the prince into a large lofty room with transparent walls, through which the light shone. Here were portraits, each one appearing more beautiful than the other, millions of happy beings, whose laughter and song mingled in one sweet melody. Some of these were in such an elevated position that they appeared smaller than the smallest rosebud, or like pencil dots on paper. In the center of the hall stood a tree, with drooping branches from which hung golden apples, both great and small, looking like oranges among the green leaves. It was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, from which Adam and Eve had plucked and eaten the forbidden fruit, and from each leaf trickled a bright red dewdrop, as if the tree were weeping tears of blood for their sin. Let us now take the boat, said the fairy. A sail on the cool waters will refresh us. But we shall not move from the spot. Although the boat may rock on the swelling water, the countries of the world will glide before us, but we shall remain still. It was indeed wonderful to behold. First came the lofty Alps, snow-clad and covered with clouds and dark pines. The horn resounded, and the shepherds sang merrily in the valleys. The banana trees bent their drooping branches over the boat. Black swans floated on the water, and singular animals and flowers appeared on the distant shore. New Holland, the fifth division of the world, now glided by, with mountains in the background, looking blue in the distance. They heard the song of the priests, and saw the wild dance of the savage to the sound of the drums and trumpets of bone, the pyramids of Egypt rising to the clouds, columns and sphinxes, overthrown and buried in the sand, followed in their turn, while the northern lights flashed out over the extinguished volcanoes of the north, in fireworks none could imitate. The prince was delighted, and yet he saw hundreds of other wonderful things, more than could be described. "'Can I stay here for ever?' asked he. "'That depends upon yourself,' replied the fairy. "'If you do not, like Adam, long for what is forbidden, you can remain here always.' "'I should not touch the fruit on the tree of knowledge,' said the prince. "'There is abundance of fruit equally beautiful.' "'Examine your own heart,' said the princess, "'and if you do not feel sure of its strength, return with the east wind who brought you. He is about to fly back.' and will not return here for a hundred years. The time will not seem to you more than a hundred hours, yet even that is a long time for temptation and resistance. Every evening when I leave you, I shall be obliged to say, Come with me, and to beckon to you with my hand. But you must not listen, nor move from your place to follow me, for with every step you will find your power to resist weaker. If once you attempted to follow me, you would soon find yourself in the hall, where grows the tree of knowledge, for I sleep beneath its perfumed branches. If you stooped over me, I should be forced to smile. If you then kiss my lips, the garden of paradise would sink into the earth, and to you it would be lost. A keen wind from the desert would howl around you, cold rain would fall on your head, and sorrow and woe would be your future lot. I will remain, said the prince. So the east wind kissed him on the forehead, and said, Be firm, then shall we meet again when a hundred years have passed. Farewell, farewell. Then the east wind spread his broad pinions, which shone like the lightning in harvest, or as the northern lights in a cold winter. Farewell, farewell, echoed the trees and the flowers. Storks and pelicans flew after him in feathery bands to accompany him to the boundaries of the garden. Now we will commence dancing, said the fairy, and when it is nearly over at sunset, while I am dancing with you, I shall make a sign, and ask you to follow me, but do not obey. I shall be obliged to repeat the same thing for a hundred years, and each time, when the trial is past, if you resist, you will gain strength, till resistance becomes easy, and at last the temptation will be quite overcome. This evening, as it will be the first time, I have warned you. After this the fairy led him into a large hall, filled with transparent lilies, 
the yellow stamina from each flower formed a tiny golden harp from which came forth strains of music like the mingled tones of flute and lyre beautiful maidens slender and graceful in form and robed in transparent gauze floated through the dance and sang of the happy life in the garden of paradise where death never entered and where all would bloom for ever in immortal youth as the sun went down the whole heavens became crimson and gold and tinted the lilies with the hue of roses then the beautiful maidens offered to the prince sparkling wine and when he had drank he felt happiness greater than he had ever known before presently the background of the hall opened and the tree of knowledge appeared surrounded by a halo of glory that almost blinded him voices soft and lovely as his mother's sounded in his ears as if she were singing to him my child my beloved child then the fairy beckoned to him and said in sweet accents come with me come with me forgetting his promise forgetting it even on the very first evening he rushed towards her while she continued to beckon to him and to smile the fragrance around him overpowered his senses the music from the harp sounded more entrancing while around the tree appeared millions of smiling faces nodding and singing man should know everything man is the lord of the earth the tree of knowledge no longer wept tears of blood for the dewdrops shone like glittering stars come come continued that thrilling voice and the prince followed the call at every step his cheeks glowed and the blood rushed wildly through his veins i must follow he cried it is not a sin it cannot be to follow beauty and joy i only want to see her sleep and nothing will happen unless i kiss her and that i will not do for i have strength to resist and a determined will the fairy threw off her dazzling attire then backed the boughs and in another moment was hidden among them i have not sinned yet said the prince and i will not and then he pushed aside the boughs to follow the princess she was lying already asleep beautiful as only a fairy in the garden of paradise could be he smiled as he bent over her and he saw tears trembling out of her beautiful eyelashes do you weep for me he whispered oh weep not thou loveliest of women now do i begin to understand the happiness of paradise i feel it to my inmost soul in every thought a new life is born within me one moment of such happiness is worth an eternity of darkness and woe he stooped and kissed the tears from her eyes and touched her lips with his a clap of thunder loud and awful resounded through the trembling air all around him fell into ruin the lovely fairy the beautiful garden sunk deeper and deeper the prince saw it sinking down into the dark night till it shone only like a star in the distance beneath him then he felt a coldness like death creeping over him his eyes closed and he became insensible when he recovered a chilling rain was beating upon him and a sharp wind blew on his head alas what have i done he sighed i have sinned like adam and the garden of paradise is sunk into the earth he opened his eyes and saw the star in the distance but it was the morning star in heaven which glittered in the darkness presently he stood up and found himself in the depths of the forest close to the cavern of the winds and the mother of the winds sat by his side she looked angry and raised her arm in the air as she spoke the very first evening she said well i expected it if you were my son you should go into the sack and there he will have to go at last said a strong old man with large black wings and a scythe in his hand whose name was death he shall be laid in his coffin but not yet i will allow him to wander about the world for a while to atone for his sin and to give him time to become better but i shall return when he least expects me i shall lay him in a black coffin place it on my head and fly away with it beyond the stars there also blooms a garden of paradise and if he is good and pious he will be admitted but if his thoughts are bad and his heart full of sin he will sink with his coffin deeper than the garden of paradise is sunk once in every thousand years i shall go and fetch him when he will either be condemned to sink still deeper or be raised to a happier life in the world beyond the stars End of The Garden of Paradise